All right. Um, so, so thanks for sort of going over my career. I was, uh, after being a Hertz fellow way back in the 1960s, I think it was the second year of graduate Hertz fellows um, when I started. Uh, then I had time at Livermore Lab uh, doing a lot of things with the in atmospheric and geophysical sciences, uh, covered things from modeling Bay Area air quality to uh, helping run a acid precipitation program in the east doing nuclear winter, which was consequence of the nuclear war, uh, volcanic eruptions and a lot of other things. So my career sort of focused on what causes uh, climate change. Um, I also ought to say during that time I had um, interesting time doing U.S. being the U.S. co-chair of a project with the Soviet Union on climate change. So over there, a, a lot as well. Um, then after being a division leader, there was sort of time for a sabbatical. I thought I'd go for a year or two to Washington, but I ended up staying there nine years, helping try and coordinate first coordinate the interagency program, which is an attempt to try and have a dozen or so agencies cooperating in what they're looking at and then facilitating the first national climate change assessment. Um, and then uh, that was through the Clinton administration and into the early Bush administration and uh, my views just weren't quite wanted. So I ended up uh, retiring and have been volunteering with the Climate Institute, which is a small NGO, but I've been able to do a lot of things there, work on the Arctic assessment and uh, I mean, one of the fun things was get to go to the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony when uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in Al Gore won the, won the uh, prize. Um, and another thing was actually write a, write a lot of legal declarations, including the one that became Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, writing the declaration on standing that Justice Stevens cited in, the, in his majority opinion. So I've had Fun and I've done some things international um, as well. So let me just go back to that time in the 60s when we were starting. Um, if you go back to that uh, time, this was one of the famous pictures, uh, Earthrise. Uh, and, and this is what Archibald McLeish wrote in the New York Times um, at the end, um, the, after seeing this picture. Uh, to see the earth as it truly is, small and blue and beautiful, in that eternal silence where it floats, is to see ourselves as riders on the earth together, brothers on that bright loveliness in the eternal cold, brothers who know now they are truly brothers. Um, I think if he wrote it now, he'd write it differently, probably not using brothers three times. Um, but the key is he talked about us being riders on the earth together. And we're really no longer just riders. We're actually creating a forcing that's gonna be changing the climate. And that's led uh, Paul Crutzen, who's a, who's an atmospheric chemist to sort of say we've entered the Anthropocene. And so uh, we'll sort of get to talk about that this time. I thought I'd sort of say um, a, a little bit about my dissertation and how I got into it. So at the time in the mid 60s, uh, Chuck Leith, who was a mathematician from Berkeley who came to Livermore in the 1950s and built uh, weapons codes, um, sort of took an internal sabbatical and constructed the world's first global general atmospheric general circulation model. There were other models that were sort of hemispheric uh, his model also had interactive clouds, which other ones didn't start doing till 10 years later. Um, it had vertical convection with clouds. It had a diurnal cycle. Um, and so he had a, whoops, he had a, uh, uh, created this code and he started looking at it. And then one Friday afternoon, which is when he used to hold his meetings with graduate students so he wouldn't go up and go skiing um, in, the, in the Sierras. Um, he brought in a, a, so this is, this slide is sort of a clip from the first movie that he made of it, which has the blue being rain bands and the, I guess it is, and the yellow being sort of pressure or the other way around. Um, he brought in a, a, a set of slides from, a, from the first satellite that was in, up in a sort of geostationary orbit showing the Pacific Basin and, and everything. 
And it turns out instead of all these large weather systems, it had a lot of small weather systems. And that got him focused on two-dimensional turbulence, which is a really interesting question. And the study of turbulence in a very thin layer, uh, sort of the atmospheric shell around the earth um, and stuff. So, so that he was doing sort of theory of trying to get at what better weather forecasting and how to do that. Um, Dr. Teller at the time was more interested in some more practical aspects and applications. Uh, it was quite cold at the time. Um, and there were proposals that had been going on since the 1870s that we should try and melt the Arctic actually. And one of the proposals, not by Teller, was to use nuclear explosions to, to try and do that. But a prevailing hypothesis about glacial interglacial cycling at the time was that if you had an open Arctic, that would lead to glaciation, sort of like ice-free conditions on the Great Lakes lead to lots of snow. And so he, his proposal for my dissertation was um, take Leith's 3D model, make it 2D in terms of dynamics to simplify it, to make it so you could run a long time, put in all the thermodynamics and try and evaluate some of the hypotheses. And there were about a dozen at the time that I looked at and uh, or at the time I looked at a, several and they, none of them really proved viable. Um, but the really interesting thing about doing this, this modeling is that even with a relatively simple representation of the processes that cover the energy balance of the earth, it led to quite a plausible representation of the latitudinal distribution of the climate and the seasonal variation of it and that there was precipitation in the tropics. And it actually was quite amazing. And, and if simple things lead to a plausible result, you think the th system must be kind of robust, that it would be hard to change. But if you go back and look at geological records, however, you find out the Earth's climate has gone through tremendous variations. It's had peak glacial conditions that are estimated to be about six degrees Celsius colder with sea level down 120 meters. So 20,000 years ago, peak of the last glacial sea level was down 120 meters. And it's had periods of great warmth that are about five, six degrees C warmer than present when there was no ice in Antarctica or Greenland which would mean sea level was 60 meters or so higher than it would be now. Um, and so the question then becomes, how can you have a robust climate and yet it changes a great deal? And the, the answer is that there are actually forcings. There's significant alterations in the energy balance that have done that. So we'll sort of talk about those. And so that's how to look at the climate issue. Um, I sort of contend they're only uh, six key findings to focus on and all the rest of sort of details. And so I'm just gonna go through them pretty quickly and we can talk about them later, some of the details later. But first one is there's really no doubt that human activities are changing atmospheric composition. It's partly CO2, but it's other things and it's changing in an unprecedented way. We have records that go back, way back in time that showing this is a very unusual and rapid rise. And there's just no question that we're doing that, um, CO2 plus other species. Um, if you go back in these other records, for example, in Antarctica, they've drilled back and they've gone, this is a record for 400,000 years, but they've now gotten back about 800,000 years. You can see, you can get a record of the temperature and you can get the CO2. So the CO2 is trapped in bubbles of air and they can measure its concentration. And the temperature they get by looking at isotopic ratios in the water because that determines sort of the relative susceptibility to evaporation. So they look at oxygen isotopes and sometimes at hydrogen isotopes and you can get a sense. And, and it's amazingly coincident about how the amount of, um, how the temperature changes and the CO2 is related. These have been scaled so it looks really good, but, but um, there's very good evidence that we're getting to understand past climate. And the third finding from the past is that if you try and rep use models and try and represent the climate of the, since the mid 19th century or sometimes even earlier uh, through the 20th century, um, it's off here. Um, if you, uh, I guess I can get rid of this or something somehow, right? Let me, okay. Um, if you do this, the observ various ones of the observations are these solid lines, 
Um, and then model results have these, this broader band. Um, now models aren't gonna exactly match what happens because basically the earth is governed by a set of nonlinear equations and you have this butterfly effect, even small variations can lead to variations in what happens. And so what you have is we're on a one particular path through this wave of this band of possibilities about what could happen. And we, it agrees pretty well. Um, I'll come back to it, but the only place there's a real sort of difference turns out to be during World War II. And there's some really suspect observations during that time. So a little bit strange. Um, what do I have to do here? What happened here? Let's see, okay. Um, so the fourth one, these sort of are looking to the future. Um, we're gonna have ongoing use of coal, oil, and natural gas. It pr presently provides about 80% of the world's energy. And so it's not gonna be a rapid transition. Uh, we've had some warming and the question is gonna be how much more warming do we have uh, going up to some sort of few degrees Celsius warmer. Uh, we're increasing the trapping of radiation. So we're sort of on this path, path upward. Um, fifth one is that we know that the environment depends on what the climate is. Just walk up a mountain and you see how vegetation changes. Or if you go from uh, the equator where it's all moist because there's a circulation that leads to rising air there, uh, you go to the subtropics, which are very dry because the air that goes up in low latitudes has to come down somewhere. Um, and, and we're seeing all kinds of things that, that can be going on. There can be biodiversity effects, effects on food pr producing areas, effects on uh, water, effects on glaciers and ice sheets that lead to sea level rise, uh, types of vegetation. So there's a whole bunch of things, extreme weather. So you're gonna have some impacts, exactly how much and exactly when, certainly worth looking at. And the sixth thing that's really clear is if you really wanna stop this additional trapping of energy that's going on that we're adding to, you basically have to eliminate the use of coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, and this is what poses just an incredible challenge to do that. I keep touching the wrong thing here. Um, do I have to get rid of this thing up here? I'm sorry. I don't know if you're seeing that, but I'm seeing it. Um, so, in response to this, these facts, which have been realized since the 1960s, there's an interesting report of the President Science Advisory Council put out in 1965 that goes through most of this information and uh, recommended that the question be addressed by Congress and the president and the cabinet. It was discussed at a very high level. So, so uh, it's something that can, can happen. And so in 1992, the leaders of the world met at the UN Framework Convention in Rio at the Earth Summit and uh, negotiated this UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which says its objective calls for stabiliz stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. So that's a stop changing atmospheric composition. Uh, do it in a way, do it at a level that will prevent what's called dangerous anthropogenic interference with the system. That's not really well defined, but um, we have to, to think about it and then do that in a way um, that will, um, in a time frame that allows ecosystems to adapt, ecosystems sort of slowly change. Uh, you know, trees don't move north, actually, seeds of trees move north and you have to regrow a tree. So ecosystems sort of shift slowly. Um, you want to make sure you ensure that food production can continue. So you don't want to. Uh, go so rapidly, and then you want to have economic development be able to proceed, which has traditionally meant, oh, well, you can't phase out fossil fuels so fast that you ruin economic development. It's turning out, however, the potential impacts on industry are sort of changing that around. That the impacts on industry and, and the risks are rising so much that uh, they, the business really needs to be a partner in doing this. Uh, let's see if I got to limit. Oh, okay. Um, and so this was negotiated. Um, it was actually basically then approved by virtually all the countries of the world, including the US Senate, which ratified it in 1992 uh, in the administration of George Herbert Walker Bush. And they've held annual meetings ever since. 
of the Conference of the Parties, the major ones in Kyoto, which led to a, a sort of proposal for what to do by 2010, one in Copenhagen that sort of laid out what to do by 2020, and then Paris in 2015, which just laid out how to continue it. And this one in Glasgow coming up in November is to evaluate how, how, we've, how we've done here. Let's see, okay. Um, if you look at how, what those things have meant, turns out not much. Um, the CO2 concentration has continued upward. Uh, despite all these promises, we'll do something. It's continuing and it's even sort of sloping up more rapidly. Um, I put on the right something about this figure that's interesting to look at. So what you see in this up and down annual cycle of northern hem of CO2 in the Northern Hemisphere that's measured at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Uh, this represents the greening of the Northern Hemisphere. So the CO2 concentration is highest in about March. It is pulled down through the year, um, through the growing season by about eight parts per million. And then in about September, October, the concentration starts going up as you're not pulling down anymore and the decay sort of takes over. So you've seen these NASA visuals of the greening of the Northern Hemisphere. Well, it turns out if you multiply by the volume of the Northern Hemisphere, each part per million, each of these parts per million um, is about a gigaton of carbon, about a billion tons of carbon. So it's taking up and giving off net effect of about 8 billion tons of carbon. Global annual emissions from fossil fuels right now are 10 gigatons per, per year of carbon. Um, the concentration doesn't go up um, by 10 each year, because first you have to split it with the Northern Hemisphere. It would be sort of 10 parts per million. You'd, you'd, uh, that would cut it, uh, cut, that cuts it in, in half as you do in the Northern Hemisphere. And then about half of what's left is taken up by the oceans and the biosphere uh, for additional growth. And so the CO2 concentration tends to go up uh, two to three, two and a half to three parts per million per year. So 25% of this. So that gives you a sense of where we are. If you want to stop this going up, you have to get the emissions well down. Um, so we're sort of stuck in this cycle. Um, there's sort of a feedback chain that keeps feeding back and keeping the situation worse. This is one way that Tom, I mean, that Ken Caldera, who used to be at Livermore, put it. Uh, so if you start at the top, you have a desire for improved well-being that leads to more demand for services that leads to uh, the need for energy for farm products for use of the land and water that leads to emissions of various things gases and aerosols that leads to higher atmospheric concentrations that leads to climate change extreme weather sea level rise and ocean acidification that leads to impacts on health ecosystems and economic development. And that leads to people saying, well, you got to fix it and I want a better standard of living. So we're sort of stuck in this cycle. And the question is how to slow it down and get out of it. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to give you a sense though, when, I, when we talk about things, people talk about general warming, but it isn't really the going up of the average temperature that is quite so much the issue. This, these are from observations, okay? So what Jim Hansen and his colleagues did was take the Northern Hemisphere land areas, look at summertime average temperature, uh, normalize the fluctuations to get a st by standard deviation so we could compare ones all over the hemisphere. And what you found in the mid 20th century was a nice Gaussian curve. You sort of colored it by thirds, just to give you the warm third, the middle third, and a a cooler third. And over 30 years, the land points varied. And if you go out to the three sigma or tenth of a percent sort of um, extreme, it, I mean, okay, it was three standard deviations of a small. So then he sort of shifted a couple of decades. And what you see is the actual observations shifted. And now instead of what was a three, stand, a three standard 0.1% uh, occurrence here, that same value is now occurring 3% of the time. And then he went another uh, sort of two decades and it went up. It, now this three, what was a three standard in the mid 20th century is now 11%. And if you go out most recently, it's up over 20%. So instead of 
sort of one in a thousand, you're now having sort of one in five kinds of situations. Now, for people in buildings, you can maybe adapt, but if you have a forest that has developed over a century in a particular region, and it's based on this kind of climate when it started growing, this kind of distribution, um, now it's way out of whack. Um, we're up at just very large occurrences of unusual conditions. If you designed your water system to be consistent with uh, this kind of standard, um, you're getting much more change. And so this is for temperature, but it, if you look at precipitation over the six continents, other than Antarctica at least, um, there's a trend toward more and more precipitation coming in extreme events. Um, so extremes are really serious. And when Houston a few years ago had what the third, what was called 500 year storm in a decade, um, that's a reflection of the fact that the fraction of conditions in these extreme ranges is really changing. Um, this sort of shows for some particular areas in the, in the Mediterranean belt in the sort of dry subtropical area. And what you're getting is these very large changes. So uh, you're getting lots more occurrences of what are very warm conditions. And that's where people are worried about, are you gonna be able to keep having, doing work outdoors and things? Um, so, so the question is really what you wanna look at. Um, what risk is sort of probability times consequence. What's been happening is there's been a lot of focus in the IPCC, which is the Inherent Governmental Panel on Climate Change, the scientific assessments and the negotiators are looking at the expected risk. We scientists want to look at the, we wanna have high confidence in our findings. So we look at the central kind of values. We average over time so you don't have noise. And so you have this slow rise projected in the global average temperature and, and risk. But if you're, um, if you're involved in other fields, if you're working for society, if you're building infrastructure, you design for the hundred year flood. You don't wanna have a, a flood that destroys your infrastructure more than once every hundred years say, or the Dutch do it, their levees at once every 10,000 years for waves and sea level storms and things. Um, you know, if you're the military, you design for contingencies. You worry about things out here. If you're an investor, you worry about the worst plausible conditions because you want your investment to be, to be uh, safe. Uh, it's been interesting in working with a fellow in the business community. He says, yeah, you should be looking out, out here. And uh, he sort of says, if you look at Moody ratings for bonds, for example, and look at their criteria for safety, they look for for the sort of having something really safe. You want the pension fund to stay around and be there when we retire. Um, and they're supposed to have some high fraction of AAA ratings. If you were to give Earth a rating now, Earth Inc a rating, which is what we have tried to do as colleagues in this, it's not much above junk bond status. We're in pretty serious trouble on what's happening because we're starting to de destabilize Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Um, I sort of said, uh, before that uh, 20,000 years ago, it was down, the sea level was down 120 meters from 20,000 years ago to 8,000 years ago, 120 centuries, sea level rose on average one meter per century as the global average temperature was going up as a rough estimate, one degree every 2000 years, every 20 centuries. We went up one degree C in the 20th century or early to the early 21st, we're probably gonna go up another two degrees C now. And so the potential for sea level rise is really huge. The equilibrium value is sort of estimated to be 15 to 20 meters of rise for every degree warming in global average temperature. And the question becomes how long does it take for equilibrium to occur? And that might be a thousand years, um, it might be less. We're seeing ice sheets start to move. Uh, but so this is a huge legacy effect of future generations. Um, should be watching time or something. I'll be getting there. So, so there's a real mismatch in talking and uh, 
You know, I mean, uh, Greta Thunberg gets a lot of attention for saying, pay attention to the science. Um, I was on a panel with her a year and a half ago, and uh, she likes to have scientists there to answer tough questions if they come up. But in my, my statement, I said, she's actually understating the issue because she was focusing on pay attention to the science, which is this, not on what's out here, these gray rhino and black swan sort of events or something that can, can happen and can really lead to some very serious consequences and be hard to adjust to. So, eh, come on. Okay, so let's go back to this and look at what you can probably do. These are the sort of ways and approaches you could go to conservation, say, well, people should all live with less, go back to nature or something. Although it turns out estimates of nature during the nuclear winter study said nature alone could only support maybe a billion people in the world. We've got seven or something. Um, you can go to efficiency, lots of potential for that. Uh, you can change technologies, try and not put out CO2. So that's mitigation. So the quote of things. You can say, well, I'm going to, I don't know how this thing keeps showing. I don't know how to get rid of this. Um, you can get, uh, try and cover and um, pull CO2 back out of the atmosphere or capture it before it's released. Um, you can go to, uh, albedo enhancement, it's called geoengineering. It's trying to figure out ways to reflect more solar radiation from the atmosphere. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, you can adapt and say, well, we're just gonna have to live with these different conditions or you can suffer. And those are sort of the set of options that you have to work for. Uh, you're not gonna choose any one. You're gonna presumably try and get a combination of all of them. Uh, the recent IPCC report from a couple of years ago sort of said, well, if we really, really, really work hard, we can pull CO2 concentrations down and maybe get emissions, net emissions to zero by the middle of the century across the world. Uh, a lot of people, we, we haven't had much progress on doing that. This sort of started earlier already. We're now up here somewhere. Um, and this requires going to negative emissions, so pulling CO2 back out of the atmosphere. And in fact, if you wanted to sort of stay at the climate we have now and not get warmer, you should be pulling out every CO2, every ton of CO2 you put in the atmosphere, you should be pulling out now. And the best estimated cost for that right now is $100 a ton of CO2. And we're putting in 10 billion tons or something. So big, big number, hard to deal with. Um, so here's where we are. Emissions are continuing to go up. Uh, I should say I talk in when I do billions of tons of carbon, the international negotiators go to billion, billions of tons of CO2 so they count the oxygen. That's why these numbers are higher. But you can see everybody has to participate. Uh, certainly all the big countries have to participate. Uh, and here's global temperature going up. And this is sort of this strange peak that, that arises from measurements over the ocean during World War II when there were all kinds of problems with making measurements for various reasons. Um, so what is the collective strategy that one might take in doing this? Um, we know as we get warm, as we get uh, warmer, we're gonna have more climate impacts as you're going through time. And this sort of red is ongoing emissions. And so if I cut emissions aggressively, maybe I can get so I don't have the temperature going up anymore. If I work hard, that's what getting to net zero would do but I'm gonna have some impacts up here. Um, I can say, well, I'd like to piece, pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. That helps reduce the ocean acidification problem, reduce the forcing. Uh, that takes time to build up. I mean, we've got a huge industry putting CO2 into the atmosphere. If you're gonna pull out that much, you really have to have a huge industry to build up. And so then this notion of solar geoengineering comes out to shave the peak temperature effect. So do something to try and pull the temperature down while you're getting things under control. Um, that's sort of what that is. These are some ideas that have been proposed over time. Uh, some by people at Livermore, like Jim Early, who was one who looked at, can you put a big mirror in space out at the L1 point, try and diminish uh, solar radiation coming in. His proposal was to build a manufacturing plant on the moon to do this, but you know, sort of, sort of, to take a bit of time to do. Uh, there are some other ones. 
Um, I can try and imitate a volcano by looking like a stratosphere, by putting aerosol in the stratosphere. And I know volcanoes cool, they have some other influences too, but I can try and cool those. Um, Edward Teller had a really interesting idea of floating balloons up there and the surface of the balloon was gonna be corner reflectors, which would reflect the solar right back to where it's coming from. Um, so there've been people who've looked at that. Uh, can you put aerosols in the troposphere? We already do that. The SO2 from coal-fired power plants sort of does that, but we're gonna be getting rid of coal-fired power plants, so we lose that. So could you reconstruct that? And there are ideas how to do it. Can I figure out how to brighten clouds? Uh, we already see that some ship exhaust when they go under low-lying clouds in clean area will brighten clouds. So can we do that? There's people looking at that. Uh, can you increase the reflectivity of the land surface? Um, you can help in some areas and it might help cities, but it's hard to do the world. You're at the surface, you have to get the solar radiation going back out to space and you got clouds in the atmosphere in between. So this is really hard to do. Um, you could try and increase the reflectivity of ocean. People have talked about micro bubbles like you see in a spa or something or a ship wake or something or floating reflectors, but you need an area about the size of a continent to have a big effect. So be in the Pacific. Um, or you can perhaps do some things that help the wintertime polar regions cool more by clearing cirrus clouds. So there are some ideas. There's of course a lot of discussion about this. Uh, you see discussion a lot about stratospheric aerosol enhancement in the media. Um, their notion, my view is that the notion of going from going to doing nothing to going to do this all at once is gonna be rather impractical. So my view is that instead of starting globally, start regionally, see if you can cool the Arctic down using some of these approaches, or can you moderate the warming of the ocean waters where tropical cyclones and hurricanes intensify? Can you do a few other kinds of things? Australians are trying to help save the coral reefs by shading them in a particular way by brightening clouds in that region. So are there things you can do? Um, so, the international community has not really gotten up to thinking about climate engineering. They think we're gonna do it all by mitigation and changing technology, but that's just not gonna be in time in my view, you're gonna have big impacts. But in any case, what's gonna happen to have to happen in the US? Basically, we gotta go electric. We gotta get as electric as fast as we can. Uh, renewable energy, there's proposals for a high voltage direct current grid across the US to move renewable energy around all sorts of things like that. Um, the business community is sometimes castigated for causing the problem, but they're gonna be the ones who have to lead in making the solution. And when you really need to get them on board, they haven't been on board and they need to get on board. The public is certainly getting aroused. So uh, that's encouraging. And we have to build our resilience. We've been suffering more and more big extreme events and we're gonna to have to do more to, to what we can. And we really need to do it fast. This notion of waiting to, you know, of all the companies saying, oh, well, we'll get it done by 2050. Uh, that's not really fast enough. Uh, we need the world to be doing it even faster than that. So I think that's all I sort of had to say, except to say applied science has been a lot of fun as a career and I've uh, really enjoyed it.